Yes, yes I'm ready on my part. Yes, so we'll be live within few seconds, so we can start. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we may go ahead, sir. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I, Dr. Tarkes Molia, Associate Professor and Head Constitutional Law of Law, formally welcomes Professor Ikramul Haq in this International Teaching Month. Welcome, Professor Haq. We were expecting your physical uh, presence because of this pandemic situation. We are able to have your interaction online. Uh, still will enjoy your interaction with our students. I formally welcome you on the behalf of Institute of Law. I am extremely privileged to host your session on the topic impact of Indian Supreme Court judgment, the development of constitutional law in Bangladesh. So what is the impact of so Supreme Court judgment in the development of Bangladesh constitutional law? Indeed, it would be a very enriching topic, sir. And uh, I would like to formally introduce Professor Ikramul Haq. Dr. Mohammad Ikramul Haq is a professor of constitutional law and a comparative constitutional law in the Department of Law at University of Dhaka. He did his PhD in constitutional law and international law at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. He completed his LLB honors and LLM at Dhaka University in both which he got first class and was awarded a gold medal. He has received a Monash Law Dean Award, Australia, Monash International Postgraduate Research Scholarship, Australia, Monash Graduate Scholarship, Australia, and scholarship by the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs he has written uh, three books and various uh, articles in the peer reviewed journal. Indeed, sir, we are honored to uh, host you in this extreme session. Dear friend, it is very essential to have an understanding of an comparative law, especially the impact of liberalization and globalization has a great impact on the constitutional development as well. In fact, the development of constitutional law is not also untouched with the impact of this liberalization and liberalization. So in this regard, it is very essential to respond to this kind of uh, need. And how you and the, what is the process by which you can cope up with the globalization and liberalization with a legal system ready prepared for that particular thing. The study to conduct this is called a comparative studies. The comparative study is the only tool which can cope up with the globalization and liberalization. And in this context, I would like to give a basic idea that why comparative law is important. The process of comparison lies at the very heart of analysis. One cannot easily make assertion about a particular characteristics of an event, institution, or form of behavior without making a comparison with another. If we are trying to be as scientific as possible, as I stated that it is a scientific method, we need, we need to examine situation where the phenomena we are investigating occurs and compare these with other institutions in which they do not occur. In a natural science, such experimentation generally take place under what we commonly described as laboratory condition. That is a situation that are tightly controlled by regulating the environment and which can be recreated in order to test and retest through experimentation. In a discipline such as law, we cannot manufacture artificial condition. In this way, so Juries use and comparison as means of analyzing similarities and differences. Comparative law also allow us to contextualize our analysis. So this, this is a scientific method as I stated. Not only comparative law compares between the country, but also it compares between the different levels of 
activity carried out within the country especially if we say the judicial uh, uh, decision then such as how decisions are made by the supreme court and high court within a country or indeed how high courts undertake a specific case comparison between the judicial decision carried out in the present with how they are operated in the past often to assess efficiency or impact of a particular change or reform also represent a legitimate foci for comparative studies with that note i would request a uh, professor uh, ikramul haq to proceed with the topic but before uh, i hand it over to professor ikramul haq there are there are few basic inf uh, essential information for the participants which are to be followed for an uh, encouraging learning session one that dear participant keep your microphone on mute keep your camera on throughout the session please address all your questions to me personally in the chat box which shall be taken by professor mohammad ikramul at the end of the session i once again welcome professor ikramul and all the participants over to you sir good morning everyone thank you uh, dr tak monia well the title of today's discussion is impact of the indian supreme court judgments on the development of constitutional law in bangladesh of course this is not going to be an exhaustive lecture of course on the issue of the impact on the indian supreme court judgments on the development of constitutional law in bangladesh this lecture rather uh, will take examples from different areas of constitutional law in bangladesh where indian supreme court judgments have played a crucial role it is worth mentioning that uh, this is neither possible nor desirable in one session to analyze all the developments of all constitutional principles in bangladesh where indian constitutional and judicial influence are found sir so i'm going to focus on certain key areas of constitutional laws in bangladesh where indian supreme court judgments have really played an influential role let me speak something about the nature of these two constitutions bangladesh constitution is of course an autonomous constitution there is no doubt about that because this is the product of the liberation war of bangladesh back in 1971 it is generally also agreed that the constitution of india is an autonomous constitution although the issue has been debated by some on the alleged ground of its existence of possible link with the earlier colonial legal regime however finally it has been settled that indian constitution because it was emanated from a new grand norm according to hans kelsen new grand norm that is the people of india who actually created the constitution of india and as such indian constitution of 1950 was also an autonomous constitution well the constitution of bangladesh was drafted by the constituent assembly back in 1971 back in 1972 which was passed on november 4 and became effective on 16 december 1972 generally speaking nationalism socialism democracy and secularism are the fundamental principles of the constitution and they are the fundamental principles of state policy as well well both bangladesh and india have similar constitutional model of protection of human rights which can, which can be compared to the original version of the international bill of rights which actually split human rights into two different compartments civil and political rights on one hand and economic social and cultural rights on the other the first group is judicial enforceable while the latter have been made judicially unenforceable constitutional principles in bangladesh and directive principles in india which are not judicially enforceable well writ is a very important constitutional remedy both in bangladesh and in india the provisions are almost alike with a number of dissimilarities of course however judicial interpretations have closed the constitutional gap and as such both have been closer to each other in practice that is why in bangladesh in writ cases indian judgments are frequently referred to comparing to india bangladesh is of course relatively 
a new constitutional polity. And as such, constitutional borrowing is not something which is unusual. Well, unlike India, Bangladesh is a unitary state with a single superior court at the top. That is the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, which has two divisions, appellate division and the high court division. Bangladesh does not have any separate constitutional court, unlike many other civil law countries. And the Supreme Court of Bangladesh has jurisdiction on all constitutional matters, like the Supreme Court of India. Well, at the very outset, let me tell something about the theoretical framework of my discussion that I'm, I'm going to present now. In the Indian subcontinent, it is true that India has the oldest constitution. And as such, it has certain pioneering role played in the development of constitutional law in the entire region. Because Indian constitutional law has a long glorious history of judicial interpretation of constitutional provisions and principles. The judicial interpretations provided by the Indian Supreme Court at different times have not only developed constitutional law, rather at the same time, they played a crucial role in the development of different constitutional principles and ideas in the region, especially in Bangladesh. That is actually what I'm going to do in today's lecture, that what is the influence of Indian judgments in the development of different constitutional law ideas in Bangladesh? We all know that Indian Supreme Court worldwide is widely known as an activist court, as an activist court, which is a unique feature of Indian Supreme Court. And Indian contributions made in the global constitutional gene pool are also remarkable. It is very important to note that in many respects, both the constitutions of Bangladesh and India are of homogeneous nature. Thus, the use of judicial pronouncements sometimes better suit Bangladeshi constitutional interpretation than taking the ideas from elsewhere. Constitutional transplantation of different ideas in between these two jurisdictions is possible due to the existence of some fundamental similarities between the two in many respects. Well, there may be a question like this, that what is the legitimacy of using foreign judgments in Bangladesh. Well, in Bangladesh, actually, there is no bar in using foreign judgments in support of a new interpretation of any law, including constitutional law. Bangladesh, as a comparatively new member in the international legal community, has a long tradition since its birth of taking an aid from foreign judgments in order to provide legal interpretations and to make sure that the legal developments are made in conformity with the global legal standard. Then there may be a question like this. Does the use of foreign judgments destroy the homogeneous, homegrown, autochthonous nature of the constitution of Bangladesh? I really do not see any such possibility because of the existence of the general principles in comparative constitutional law regarding constitutional transplantation. Generally speaking, a domestic law does not directly adopt a foreign idea in Toto. Rather, the idea is transplanted as it fits in the specific unique legal culture. There is no straight jacket formula in this transplantation process. Well, now I'm, I'm, I'm going to describe certain uh, issues in the constitutional law of Bangladesh that were actually influenced by Indian Supreme Court judgments. And I, I, I'm sharing my screen. I hope that that is visible from everyone. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, the first thing that, that, that I have chosen to discuss, that is the expanded meaning of the right to life. We all know that the constitutional idea of the right to life has two different meanings. One is classical meaning, another is the new white meaning. The classical meaning of the right to life includes only civil and political right perspective of the right to life or the negative perspective of the right to life, while the new white meaning includes different types of human rights within it. And of course, it includes both positive and negative aspects of the right. This particular adaption of the expanded meaning of the right to life in Bangladesh was actually influenced by Indian judgments. Let me examine that particular issue in detail. 
Well, July 1st, 1996 is a remarkable day in the history of the constitutional law in Bangladesh. Why? Because on that day, the High Court Division of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh adopted an expanded meaning of the right to life in Mohidin Farooq case. This is Mohidin Farooq one. I'm going to discuss three Mohidin Farooq cases. Dr. Mohidin Farooq is just like M.C. Mehta of India. Okay, so there are a lot of cases filed by Dr. Mohidin Farooq. Well, in adopting this particular expanded meaning, the High Court Division has extensively referred to Indian judgment starting with Francis Kuralai case of 1981. Well, the court, the court has actually declared that, that in the absence of any such interpretation from our domain, that means what is the meaning of the right to life? The court said that in the absence of any such interpretation from our domain, we may see what meaning was given by the superior courts of other countries to the right to life. Then the court said that there is a similarity between Article 21 of the Constitution of India and Article 32 of the Constitution of Bangladesh. Both these articles have incorporated the constitutional right to life. Then it is referred to a number of Indian cases on the point, starting with Francis Koralai versus Union of India, which is a very famous case in India, I, I know. Well, Dr. Mohidin Farooq quoted one paragraph from that particular Francis case that says, Indian court says, the question which arises is whether the right to life is limited only to protection of limb or faculty, or does it go further and embrace something more? We think that the right to life includes the right to life with human dignity and all that goes along with it, namely the bare necessities of life, such as adequate nutrition, clothing and shelter over the head and facilities for reading, writing and expressing oneself in diverse forms freely moving about and mixing and commingling with fellow human beings. The court goes on and referred to Bundho Mukti Morcha case, which is another landmark case in Indian constitutional law decided back in 1984. In that particular case, Indian Supreme Court said, and that was quoted, that was also quoted in Dr. Mohidin Farooq case. It must include protection of the health and the strength of workers, men and women, and of the tender age of children against abuse, opportunities and facilities for children to develop in a healthy manner and in conditions of freedom and dignity, educational facilities, just and humane conditions of work and maternity relief. The court goes on, goes on, and referred to another landmark judgment, Olga Tellis case, Olga Tellis case. In Olga Tellis case, Indian Supreme Court, Indian Supreme Court, has clearly declared that an equally important facet of the right to life is the right to livelihood. An Indian Supreme Court added the element of the right to livelihood with the right to life. Well, all these things, all these things have extensively influenced the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. And the Supreme Court of Bangladesh also referred to a number of other recent cases like Vincent versus India, Vikram Dev Singh versus State of Bihar, Shubhash Kumar versus State of Bihar, and referring to all these Indian judgments, the court in Bangladesh concluded on the basis of all these judgments that from the above decisions, it appears that the right to life is not only limited to the protection of life and limbs, but extends to the protection of health and the strength of workers, their means of livelihood, enjoyment of pollution-free water and air, bare necessities of life, facilities for education, development of children, maternity benefit, free movement, maintenance and improvement of public health by creating and sustaining conditions congenial to good health and ensuring quality of life consistent with human dignity. So it is clear before us that in Dr. Mohidin Farooq case, 1st July, 1996, for the first time, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh expanded, uh, accept, accepted and expanded meaning of the right to life, which was extensively influenced by Indian judgment. Well, uh, 24 days after the 1st July of 1996, in Mohidin Farooq II case, the appellate division, I mean, that superior division, the appellate division of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh recognized that particular expanded meaning of the right to life. And in doing so, in doing so, the court also has referred to Indian judgments. Again, on 28 August 1997, one year after, 
the Mohidin Farooq one case was decided. The court clearly said that in that case, after discussing various decisions of different jurisdictions, especially of the Supreme Court of India, it was held. It was held. That it, it has referred to Mohidin Farooq one case, which decided actually expanded meaning of the right to life being influenced by Indian Supreme Court judgments. Well, now I'm coming to the next point. That is about liberalization of Lucas standing and public interest litigation. Well, we all know that the idea of Lucas standing was actually rigidly formulated in British constitutional law. And that was adapted both in India and Bangladesh initially, of course. But, but, but that, that, that particular interpretation was changed even in England with four famous Blackburn cases, of course. And, and Bangladesh also has adapted the new liberal construction of the term Lucas standing, being influenced basically by four Blackburn cases back in 1970. Well, it was actually decided in 1974 in Kazi Mukhlis Rahman case that adapted a liberal interpretation to the Lucas standing for filing a writ petition in the form of public interest litigation. And in this particular area, we can see an interesting phenomenon of Bangladesh constitutional law that Bangladesh decided it before India because India adopted this particular liberal interpretation in, uh, in 1982, while it was adopted by Bangladeshi court in 1974. So in this particular area, Bangladesh was ahead of Indian development. And in this particular case, in this particular case, um, um, the court actually was influenced by four Blackburn cases. However, however, one interesting thing that I'd like to mention here is that also that concept was established in Kazi Mukhlis Rahman case back in 1974. It took 22 years to develop the idea. And in the process of the development of the idea, the liberalization of Lucas standing was extensively influenced by the development that took place in India. That means although the concept was established in 1974, but the concept was elaborated in 1966, 1996. And at that time, at that time, Indian influence is visibly prominent because in 1996, in 1996, the court actually referred to S.P. Gupta and other cases from Indian jurisdiction. While well, Indian judgments have played the pioneering role in developing and popularizing the idea of liberalization of Lucas Standy, and consequently the opening of the scope of public interest litigation. Well, the court said specifically in Mohiddin Farid two case on 25 July 1996, the appellate division, Bangladeshi appellate division said, what is sufficient interest? And the court replied, this topic has been eloquently summed up by the Indian Supreme Court in the case of S.P. Gupta and others, which is a very famous case, not only in India, rather in the entire uh, South, South Asian region, S.P. Gupta case decided in 1982. And the appellate division said it, the appellate division said it, and I fully subscribe to that statement. So the appellate division has fully subscribed to the statement made by the Indian Supreme Court in S.P. Gupta case. Let us see, in short, what, what, what is said by Indian court in that particular S.P. Gupta case. Indian court said, what is sufficient interest to give standing to a member of the public would have to be determined by the court in each individual case. It is not possible for the court to lay down any hard and fast rule or any straight jacket formula for the purpose of defining or delimiting sufficient interest. It has necessarily to be left to the discretion of the court. And then the court said a very interesting statement that the judge who has the correct social perspective and who is on the same wavelength as the constitution will be able to decide without any difficulty and in consonance with the constitutional objectives, whether a member of the public moving the court in a particular case has sufficient interest to initiate the action. Does we see that the speak of the case immensely influenced uh, the appellate division in, in elaborating the concept of the Lucas standing. 
Lutifur Rahman, Justice Lutifur Rahman, another judge in that particular case, in the same case, focused on the point that Indian Supreme Court judgments have clarified the concept of liberalization of Lucas Scandi in a series of cases, as he has observed that Dr. Mohiddin Farooq has cited a large number of decisions from Indian jurisdiction to show how the question of Lucas Scandi has been considered in the high courts of India, including the Supreme Court for evolution and development of public interest litigation in India. Then he has referred to Fertilizer Corporation case along with S.P. Gupta case. Well, uh, from S.P. Gupta case, uh, he, he has quoted that we therefore hold that any member of the public having sufficient interest can maintain an action for judicial redress for public injury. Well, we have seen it earlier. Then in paragraph 79, in paragraph 79 of Mohiddin Farooq case in uh, 1996, the appellate division said that Chief Justice made a comment about the Chief Justice of India. Chief Justice Bhagavati, who is the real exponent of public interest litigation in India, has more appropriately termed it as social action litigation rather than public interest litigation. Justice Bhagavati has also expressed the view that the substance of social action litigation is much wider than that of the public interest litigation of the United States. And this particular opinion was actually accepted in, in Bangladeshi uh, jurisdiction. And the court then, then uh, referred to Fertilizer Corporation case, another very important case, uh, which, was, which was decided uh, a very enlightened judge, Justice Krishnayar, whom I met personally back in 1996 once in a meeting. Well, uh, uh, Justice Krishnayar said, restrictive rules about standing are in general inimical to a healthy system of growth of administrative law. If a plaintiff with a good cause is turned away merely because he's not sufficiently affected personally, that could mean that some government agency is left free to violate the law. Such a situation would be extremely unhealthy and contrary to the public interest litigation. Well, uh, now I'm switching to the next point that is about the Suomoto read. Suomoto read for enforcement of fundamental right. Can the court issue a Suomoto rule against the government? In Bangladesh constitutional law jurisprudence, Tayyip case decided back in 2011 by the appellate division is a famous case. In this particular case, the then Chief Justice of Bangladesh, in that case, Justice ABM Khairul Haq, has clearly said that in India, after initial hesitation, the Supreme Court made a bold assertion in the case of S.P. Gupta versus Union of India and held that any member of the public acting bona fide can move the court. This decision was followed in People's Union for Democratic Rights versus Union of India, decided in 1982 in the same year, where the principle of rule of law was invoked in allowing locus standing in the PIL. Let, let me tell you very shortly, very briefly, the facts of Taib case. A news item was published in, uh, in a local newspaper on 2nd December 2000 to the effect that one Shahida was forced to marry her, her paternal cousin, Shamsul, under a so-called fatwa pronounced by Hazi Abdul Haq on the ground that her marriage was dissolved consequent upon an incident of about one year ago. While her husband, out of anger, uttered the word talaq. But in spite of that, Shahida and Saiful continued their marital tie. The High Court Division, on taking notice of the aforesaid news item, issued a suomoto rule against the government authorities concerned for their failure to protect the fundamental rights of that poor Shahida. Well, it was one of the basic questions before the court that that was about uh, the authority of the court to issue a suomoto rule, whether the court was justified in issuing the suomoto rule. Well, in that particular case, the author judge was Justice Sayyid Mahmoud Hussain. He, he was then a member of the appellate division. Presently, he is the Honorable Chief Justice of Bangladesh. Sayyid Mahmoud Hussain J, in that particular case, in establishing the concept of suomoto, the power of the court to issue suomoto rule, in particular relied on Indian constitutional law jurisprudence. He said, I'm reading from his judgment, the Supreme Court of India has further expanded its jurisdiction by entertaining petitions under Article 32 of the Constitution, not only 
from associations or organizations or individuals interested in a common cause or an advocate, even journalists, but also on the basis of letters written by such persons containing a complaint of maltreatment of under trial prisoners or women in police custody. Then he has referred to Sheila Bose versus the state of Maharashtra and Mukesh Kumar versus the state of MP. He continued, he continued, Justice Mahmoud Hussain in Taib case. It was further observed that the court should not object to the procedural technicalities being relaxed. What a wonderful liberal interpretation. The court should not object to the procedural technicalities being relaxed. That is to say, it should provide easy access to justice, to the weaker sections of humanity, and to combat exploitation and injustice, and to secure for the underprivileged segments of society their social and economic entitlements, to redress public injury, enforce public duty, protect social rights, vindicate public interest, and rule of law. And Justice Hussain made the references in this connection to Indian cases of the state of West Bengal versus Sampallal, the state of HP versus parent of student medical college, and Malik brothers versus Norendu Dadich. All these cases were referred by Justice Said Mahmoud Hussain in that particular type case. And finally, the court concluded that yes, the High Court Division did the right job. The High Court Division did rightly issue the Suomutu rule by its own. Well, now I am coming to a different type of point that is um, about the protection of environmental rights through public interest litigation, which is uh, an immensely important issue during this time, protection of environment. Well, Latif Rahman, Justice Latif Rahman, in Mohiddin Farooq case, pointed out that Indian judgments have played a role of torchbearer as regards the protection of environmental rights through public interest litigation. As he said, I'm reading from his judgment what he said. If you look to the cases recently disposed of by the Supreme Court of India, then we find that there is a trend of judicial activists to protect environment through public interest litigation in environmental cases. In Bangladesh, such cases are just knocking at the door of the court for environmental policy making, and the court is being involved in this particular case. And the court finally relied on Virender Gaur versus the state of Haryana, where the Supreme Court of India said, Supreme Court of India said in that particular case, the state in particular has a duty in that behalf and to shed its extravagant, unbridled sovereign power and to forge in its policy to maintain ecological balance and hygienic environment. Referring to this particular statement made by Indian Supreme Court in Dr. Mohidin Farooq case, the court actually imposed an obligation on the, uh, on the government of Bangladesh also to protect the environmental rights of the people at large. Well, now I'm coming to a different type of point that is about the constitutional status of the judges. Well, the question is, can the status of the judges be compared with the status of the civil servants? This particular issue was settled in a very famous Indian case, All Indian Judges Association versus Union of India. Well, in Emerald Kai's case, in Emerald Kai's case in Bangladesh, the High Court Division decided that the judges have a different type of constitutional status that cannot be compared to the status of the civil servants. Well, in reaching to this particular conclusion, the court actually relied on all Indian judges association versus Union of India, this particular case. I, I'm reading from the judgment uh, delivered in Emerald Kai's case, where the judge actually quoted something from all Indian judges case. The court said, Indian court said, the judicial service is not service in the sense of employment of the judiciary. The exercise, the sovereign judicial power of the state, they are the holders of public offices as the ministers and the members of the legislature. The judges at whatever level they may be represent the state and its authority, unlike the administrative executive or the members of other services. 
the members of the other services, therefore, cannot be placed, cannot be placed on par with the members of the judiciary, either constitutional or functional. On the basis of this particular statement and other relevant constitutional provisions in Bangladesh, the court concluded that, that the constitutional status of the judges or the service of the judges is something different than the service of the civil servants. Well, I'm moving on to another very interesting point because we all know that both in Bangladesh and in India, we see a parliamentary type of government. Now the question is, the question is, what is the nature of the sovereignty of parliament? Is, is the parliament in Bangladesh sovereign just like British parliament? or its sovereignty is limited. In settling this particular issue in Imbrul Kais back in 2013, the court actually relied, the court actually relied on a very famous Indian constitutional law case that is known as special reference case number one of 1964, where a very enlightened Indian chief justice was there, Justice Gajendra Gatkar, who has pronounced uh, number of, uh, uh, a number of interesting judgments. Well, in that particular case, he said that in a democratic country governed by a written constitution, it is the constitution which is the supreme and sovereign. Therefore, there can be no doubt that the sovereignty which can be claimed by parliament in England cannot be claimed by legislature in India in the literal by absolute sense. In the literal sense, cannot, cannot be claimed. And this particular position has been adopted in Bangladesh as well. There is another case, another famous case in Bangladesh, Zedai Khan Panna versus Bangladesh, decided back in 2015. Zedai Khan is a very senior lawyer in Bangladesh. Well, the High Court Division in that particular case quoted from another Indian case, Raj, Raja Rampal versus Honorable Speaker Lok Shava and others back in 2007. Indian court said, Parliament in India, unlike in England, a wonderful statement, Parliament in India, unlike in England, is not supreme. Rather, it is the Constitution of India that is supreme. And Parliament will have to act within the limitations imposed by the Constitution. And if we analyze the constitutional history of India, we can see that a lot of, lot of amendments, constitutional amendments, had subsequently declared to be void by the Indian Supreme Court. And same thing happened in Bangladesh. A number of constitutional amendments have been declared to be void by the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. Well, in Zedai Khan Panna case, the High Court Division, referring to this particular Raja Rampal case, concluded that the above view of the Indian Supreme Court, in my humble opinion, I'm reading it from, from, from our judgment, the above view of the Indian Supreme Court clearly holds good in our jurisdiction. This is clearly a case of constitutional transplantation of an idea uh, because of homogeneous nature, because of homogeneous nature, because in Bangladesh, also the constitution is the supreme law of the land. In Bangladesh, the parliament is the creation of the constitution and article 65, one of the constitution has clearly declared that the parliament is, has been created under the authority of the constitution to make the laws under the constitution, not to make any law at its sweet will, of course not. Okay, then I'm coming to the next point. That is a very interesting point, basic structure of the constitution. Well, basic structure of the constitution, this particular idea was totally unknown in Bangladesh till 1989, till 1989. In 1989, in Arohan Sanchodri versus Bangladesh, a constitutional amendment was declared to be void, null and void, and unconstitutional on the alleged ground of violation of the concept of basic structure of the constitution. The Constitution Eighth Amendment that actually divided the High Court Division into eight different permanent benches in different places of the country, and the court thought that it violated the concept of basic structure of the Constitution of Bangladesh and declared that particular amendment to be void on the ground of violation of the concept of basic structure. Till then, till then, there was no such legal pronouncement, no such constitutional provision embodied 
in Bangladesh regarding the basic structure of the constitution. So every good, everybody, everybody got a constitutional law, de novo, in Bangladesh back in 1989. And that was done under the influence of different Indian cases. I'm just, I'm just putting some of those. Keshavananda Bharati case, a very important, a significant milestone case in Indian, Indian, uh, Indian jurisdiction. That Keshavananda Bharati case was extensively followed in Anurasan Choudhury versus Bangladesh. Along with Keshavananda, Indira Gandhi case decided in 1975, Minerva Mills case reported in 1980, Waman Rao case 1981. Based on all these decisions, the court concluded that there are certain basic features of the constitutions, although they are not explicitly written in the constitution. Thus, you see that the adoption of the concept of basic structure was deeply influenced by Indian concept of basic structure. That was actually adopted in India as well by the Indian Supreme Court, not by any express constitutional amendment. An interesting phenomenon, I, I'm just giving you an update of the theory of basic structure in Bangladesh. That so in 89, in, in 1989, both Bangladesh and India came to an equal status. That both the countries judicially recognized the concept of basic structure of the constitution. But what happened later in Bangladesh in 2011, Bangladesh adopted an article, amended an article, Article 7B of the Constitution. That Article 7B of the Constitution has expressly recognized basic features of the Constitution of Bangladesh. So what was judicially incorporated back in 1989, being influenced by the Indian judgments uh, that later has been adopted constitutionally by way of express uh, constitutional provision made in this regard. And perhaps, perhaps this particular uh, provision regarding basic structure um, is the first of its kind in Bangladesh because, because of its extensive nature. Uh, if I get a chance, perhaps I, I'll speak on this particular issue later, sometimes at a convenient time. Uh, well, now I'm moving on to the next point that is a very small point, equality and the doctrine of reasonable classification or intelligible differentia. That we all know that equality is a basic constitutional right both in Bangladesh and in India. And we also know this particular doctrine of reasonable classification, that doctrine, doctrine of reasonable classification does actually allow making apparently discriminatory laws. Well, in Imran Khai's case, in paragraph 176, I'm reading it from the judgment, the broad principle governing the application and extent of the articles 14, article 14 in Indian constitution, our Article 27 and 29 have been interacted and reiterated in so many Indian cases, our, our court said, in so many Indian cases that it would be an idle parade of familiar learning to review the multitudinous cases in which the constitutional assurance of equality before the law has been applied, observed Matthew in a case decided back in 1974 in later decisions, there are many other cases that was actually referred later. And the court conclude, concluded that the court concluded in paragraph 177 that from the discussions of the above laws and cases on Article 14 of Indian Constitution, and the cases on Article 14 of Indian Constitution, and the last clause of the first section of the 14th Amendment of American Constitution, which are similar to Article 27 of our Constitution, it can be summed up that there cannot be a single law to be applied uniformly to all persons disregarding their basic differences with others. Once the differences are identified, then the persons or things may be classified into different categories according to those distinctions, which are known as permissible criteria or intelligible differentia. Well, now I'm coming to a very interesting point. Uh, that is, the fundamental principles of state policy in the Constitution of Bangladesh and the directive principles of state policy in the Constitution of India. Well, I think the first thing to be said about this is that it was a myth, it was a myth both in Bangladesh and in India that we have actually followed the Irish model of 1937. The fact is different, the truth is different because Indian position is a little bit different than 
Irish model. And Bangladeshi position is also significantly different from Irish model. Of course, of course, there is a fundamental similarity that the principles are not judicially enforceable in Ireland, are not judicially enforceable in India, are not judicially enforceable in Bangladesh. But still, still there are some, set, some certain significant um, differences. Well, in Bangladesh, let me, let me clarify the point first, the position of Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, the constitution of Bangladesh has incorporated economic, social, and cultural rights in part two of the constitution in the form of judicially unenforceable fundamental principles of state policy. Article 8.2 of the constitution has clearly declared that these particular constitutional principles shall not be judicially enforceable. Okay, Indian constitution has also made this particular declaration that the directive principles of state policy, which basically includes human rights of economic, social, and cultural nature in Indian constitution, they will not be judicially enforceable. Fine. But the thing is that there is a very interesting provision incorporated in the constitution of Bangladesh alongside that particular a, Article 8.2. That is in part one of the constitution. That is Article 7, Clause 2. Article 7, Clause 2 says that any law that is made in violation of any constitutional provision shall be void. Any law that violates any provision of the constitution shall be void. Indian constitution does not have any such similar provision. Article 7.2 of the constitution. Now what happened in Bangladesh? that Dr. Kamal Hussain and Barrister Amur al-Islam, two senior most prominent lawyers of the country, in Kudrut -e Elahi case, in Kudrut -e Elahi case, before the court back in 1992, pointed out one particular issue before the court, that my Lord, what will happen? If the government makes a law, if the parliament makes a law that violates one fundamental principle of state policy, what will you do? And they argued that in such a situation, the court should declare that particular piece of law that violates fundamental principle of state policy to be unconstitutional. That means negative, negative enforcement of that particular constitutional principle. I'm assuming that everyone has the uh, basic knowledge of constitutional law. So, because I, I'm talking about um, on a comparative issue. Well, so I'm not going through in detail of that positive enforcement and negative enforcement of the constitutional ideas. Well, so what was argued before the court by Dr. Kamal Hussain and Barrister Amirul Islam, that was nothing but negative enforcement of fundamental principle of state policy. Now the question is, is negative enforcement of fundamental principle of state policy possible to do under the present scheme of the constitution of Bangladesh. Article 8.2 in one hand has created a constitutional bar in the way of enforcement. That is expressly declared, they shall not be judicially enforceable. But Article 7.2 has allowed, has allowed to declare any unconstitutional law to be unconstitutional if that is found to be in violation of any constitutional provision. And of course, that constitutional provision includes the constitutional provisions inserted as fundamental principles of state policy as well. So here, see, here we see an apparent contradiction between Article 8.2 and Article 7.2. Dr. Hussain and Mr. Islam tried to make a distinction and tried to argue before the court that, my Lord, Article 8.2 bars positive enforcement bars positive enforcement. So a person cannot apply before the court to have the medical treatment. But if the government makes a law violating a fundamental principle of state policy, then there will be no harm in enforcing that particular fundamental principle of state policy negatively under Article 
And as such, we can bring a harmonious interpretation between Article 7.2 and Article 8.2 of the Constitution of Bangladesh. The court did not agree, rejected the idea. Interestingly, one dissenting judge in the High Court Division in that particular case, Justice Naimuddin Ahmed, I do respect him. He was a very knowledgeable person. Justice Naimuddin Ahmed supported this particular contention made by these two prominent lawyers. And Mr. Justice Naimuddin Ahmed, in a dissenting opinion, said that it is possible in Bangladeshi constitutional law to judicially enforce a fundamental principle of state policy negatively under Article 72 of the Constitution, which is not possible under Indian constitutional law. Now, what's the point I'm going to make? Because I'm, I'm going to make a comparative discussion between Bangladesh and India. What happened in Bangladesh, because of excessive influence of Indian judgments, sometimes that has created problem as well. Because in Bangladesh, it has been generalized that the fundamental principle of state policy is just like the directive principle of state policy. So whenever a valid point was argued before the court, that was also not accepted. This is very unfortunate. And this happened due to the influence of Indian judgments because Indian judgments generally have not made this particular uh, scope for negative enforcement of of, of one directive principle of state policy. And that's why even the court ignored an express constitutional provision in this regard. What is the impact of such uh, influence? The in impact is that what happened back in 2010, 18 years after Kudrut Elahi was decided. Back in 2010, there was a famous case decided by uh, the appellate division of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, Advocate Zulahashuddin case. This advocate Zulashuddin case was about the imposition of VAT in diagnostic services in the private clinic. So the government made a law that everyone has to pay VAT while receiving any sort of diagnostic service from any private clinic. So that was a taxable service. Mr. Zulashuddin challenged this particular law before the court. And he argued before the court, my Lord, it violates the right to life. That expanded meaning of the right to life was argued. And right to life is a constitutionally guaranteed fundamental right. So there is no question regarding its judicial enforceability. And the court, court declared that particular law to be void. And in that particular case, it was finally settled that that in the form of tax is illegal to impose on any diagnostic service in Bangladesh. Fine, I do agree with the judgment, but would you please look into the judgment? Look, look into the main issue of this particular judgment. What was the main issue in Advocate Zulashuddin case? Directly speaking, that was nothing but something related to health care, medical care. Because if you have to pay tax while receiving a medical service, that firstly affects your right to medical care, health care, and indirectly affects the right to life. But health care or medical care was not argued before the court. Right to life was argued before the court. Why? Did he have, Mr. Zulasuddin, any other way to enforce it directly? The answer is yes. According to Article 72, that Article 72 of the Constitution, that particular piece of law could be declared void. But that was neither argued by the lawyers nor established by the judges. In the guess, in the generalization of that particular, due to the generalization of that particular uh, concept, that all principles are same in India and Bangladesh. They are not judicially enforceable. Uh, well, I'm almost at the end of my lecture uh, due to the shortage of time. Uh, I, I, I'll try to focus on uh, two more, two or three more ideas very briefly. One is public trust doctrine, public trust doctrine, that the resources belong to the state 
and the state is the trustee of all natural resources. So the state should take care of the rivers, of the trees, of the open field, of the entire environment, of all lands, just like a trustee. This particular concept was established in a famous Indian case, M.C. Mehta versus Kamal Nath. M.C. Mehta versus Kamal Nath. In Shah Abdul Hanan case, back in 2010, the High Court Division adopted that particular concept of public trust doctrine that was expounded in uh, Kamal Nath M.C. Mehta case by the Indian Supreme Court. Of course, of course, that Indian judgment of M.C. Mehta recognized uh, the British concept of public trust doctrine. And eventually, that British concept of public trust doctrine was accepted both in Bangladesh and in India. So Bangladesh was influenced basically by British judgment. But of course, of course, uh, it has referred to a number of uh, interesting cases on this particular point in adopting this view in our jurisdiction. The court, in a, in a very recent case in 2016, has particularly mentioned about the Indian influence in this particular field. The court said, alongside, we find that the views expressed by the Supreme Court of India in the case reported in 1997, one Supreme Court case is 88, M.C. Mehta versus Kamal is of great persuasive value. M.C. Mehta case is of great persuasive value. It was admitted by the court. That is how. That is how, that, that was the main research question in my lecture, that how has the Indian Supreme Court judgment influenced Bangladeshi judgments? Well, there is another popular concept in Bangladesh that is legitimate expectation. This idea of legitimate expectation was basically adopted from British concept, but of course, via different Indian judgments. In accepting this particular idea of legitimate expectation, the court in Bangladesh has referred to different Indian judgments, including Madras City Wine Merchants Association versus State of Tien, where uh, a detailed guideline regarding legitimate expectation was provided. Well, there is another interesting uh, constitutional issue of course power of judicial review regarding policy matters. That, that can the court, can the court make a scrutiny of the policy matters of the government. Can they go do that? In Bangladesh, the present position is that, yes, can, the court can do it, but not, not in every case, only in appropriate cases. And what are those appropriate cases? In order to clarify that particular point, in Shah Abdul Hanan case back in 2010, the High Court Division referred to 16 Indian judgments. 16 Indian judgments on the issue of the judicial review of policy matters of the government. Well, a very interesting and very significant constitutional law issue, both in Bangladesh and India, that is the protection of women's rights. Due to the patriarchal philosophy in these two countries, women sometimes, in many times, become victim of many things in the society. We admit, we admit that particular point. And sexual harassment is a common problem, both in Bangladesh and in, in, and in India. And India, in India, there is a famous case of Vishakha. Vishakha versus the state of Rajasthan. In that particular case, Indian Supreme Court formulated a guideline in the form of law in order to protect women against sexual harassment. That was a sort of judicial lawmaking that did not only formulate the guidelines, at the same time, that adopted a new definition provided by the CEDAW Convention on the Elimination of uh, Discrimination Against Women. That CEDAW definition, wide definition of discrimination was adopted in that particular Vishaka case. What happened in Bangladesh? There is an NGO named Bangladesh National Women Lawyers Association. This particular NGO, filed a case against the government in order to protect in order to protect women from sexual harassment and in this particular case the court at the end formulated guidelines just like vishaka case just like vishaka case it was a revolutionary judgment in bangladesh i'm telling you because this is the first of its kind where a bangladeshi court formulated guidelines in the form of clear laws, 
it was a sort of judicial lawmaking. This particular judicial, this particular type of judicial lawmaking was done, being inspired by Vishaka case. Well, perhaps it is time to uh, wrap up my lecture because uh, I'm almost at the end of the lecture. So the last point that I'd like to focus here with this particular point, I'm going, going to conclude my lecture. Uh, so I'm taking another five minutes. I think that is okay. Well, uh, public compensation, the idea of public compensation. Compensation is, a base, is basically an idea of private law, a flow of tort. But as, 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 a, as, as, as an idea of constitutional law, it has been accepted in India first. It has been accepted in India first. In Bangladesh, this particular idea of public compensation as a constitutional remedy was totally unknown. For example, if the government gives an unlawful detention to a person, can the government be ordered by the court to pay compensation to that particular person who was detained unlawfully. Well, this concept was unknown till 1997. April 7, 1997 was a remarkable day, was another remarkable day in the history of constitutional law of Bangladesh. Because on that day, the High Court Division in Bilkis Akhtar Hussain case, which is known as Bilkis case. In that particular case, for making an unlawful detention by the government, the court for the first time in the history ordered to pay compensation to the parties, compensation to those unlawful detainees. And the court gave this order being inspired by two landmark Indian cases. One is Rudulsha, another is, another is Nilabhuti Behera. One is Rudulsha, another is Nilabhuti Behera case. In that particular case, the, the court the, the court quoted in that uh, in that case Bilkis case I'm reading it from the, from the judgment that in Rudulsha case the Supreme Court of India held that in this jurisdiction the Supreme Court of India can pass an order for compensation to habeas corpus case and the court then referred to Simuti Nilabuti Behera I'm not reading it for shortage of time and 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 finally finally the High Court Division awarded compensation although that compensation was not accepted later by the appellate division, but, but it, was, it was settled by the High Court Division as a principle that the court can award compensation. In a comparatively recent case of Zedai and Panna case decided back in, 19, uh, back, back in 2015, back in 2015, this is also a case in 2015 where the Supreme Court favored the idea of payment of compensation to the parties public compensation as a constitutional remedy. In this particular case, I'm, I'm quoting from, uh, from the judgment, paragraph 72, that the judge said, the Indian decisions adverted to above have a persuasive value, have a persuasive value. We find no reason whatsoever to disagree with the ratios enunciated by different high courts of India and the Indian Supreme Court with regard to awarding compensation to the victims by the state on account of violations of human rights by the public functionaries. In substance, we are in respectful agreement with the Indian decisions that have evolved our jurisprudence of compensation for the benefit of the victims of torture. So the latest update is that the finally, finally, the first case of payment of constitutional remedy of public law compensation is the CCB Foundation case decided back in 2016. This is the first case where compensation has been paid actually. And in this particular case, the judges also extensively relied on different Indian judgments, including Rudul Shah and Nilabhuti Behera case. And with this, I'm concluding my lecture with, with a very brief a conclusion that different types of influence we can see. Uh, the influences are constitutional transplantation of an idea, using it as an aid to interpretation, supporting role to the existing interpretation, role in establishing new interpretation, role by creating comparative discussion. And sometimes it has a negative impact that, that we have seen in fundamental principles of state policy. That's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, now we should be moving towards uh, question and answer session. And before, before I, I'm going to that session, 
I, I'd like to express my thanks to all faculty members, professors, researchers, constitutional lawyers, and law students from India and from around, around the world who have listened to my lecture. And I highly appreciate the Nirma University that it has organized such an international teaching month in which there are huge academic interactions throughout the month, along with nearly 70 jurists from different parts of the world of diverse living legal backgrounds. Again, one point I'd like to mention here that owing to the homogenous nature of the legal systems of the South Asian region, it is more important for us to be collaborating in such academic endeavors, I strongly believe. This type of academic exchange undoubtedly enriches global pool of legal knowledge. I really appreciate this initiative taken by Nirmai University, and I'm grateful for, to them for inviting me to be one of the speakers at the program. And I see a time when after the pandemic ends, we'll be able to get together at Nirma University's wonderful scenic campus, which I visited back in 2019, to be witness to more academic collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ikramalak, for enlightening uh, insight on the contribution of Indian Supreme Court in the develop constitutional development of Bangladesh courts. Now, I will not take much more time, but I will just uh, conclude in two uh, lines that about the entire lecture that you encompass the entire journey, journey of uh, the role of judiciary played, uh, role played by the judiciary in India and Bangladesh both. So the one thing is very clear that in both the countries, the Supreme Court has played a very vital role in safeguarding and protecting the right of the peoples. And that is the reason the success of the constitution in India and Bangladesh both compared to our neighbor country, Pakistan, because it is the judiciary who has played a very important role and active role of judiciary has sustained the constitutionalism and the faith of people in the constitution. In the nutshell, if I want to uh, uh, conclude these two lines. Second thing is that when it comes to uh, your bad and elaborate uh, study, uh, comparison of directive principle of state policy in India and Bangladesh, but as you stated that you have uh, Article 7, Clause 2, which makes that it, there can be an enforcement of a uh, a constitutional law for breaching of any of the provision which the Indian constitution doesn't have. But I would just like to uh, do a further study and we may have a further discussion. I'm just putting a note. Article 31C, which gives an primacy to directive principle or fundamental right, which I think that the Bangladesh constitution doesn't have, which we'll discuss separately because uh, otherwise it will yeah. take time. Or if you want to say or a few two minutes highlight, you can focus, sir. So that is the one question from my side one. And one more question we due to positive of time will not take much more question. There is one another question and that is from Dr. Vikas Upadhyay who teach a constitutional law. And that is related to your article 32, which is similar with our article 21 of the constitution, right to life. Mm -hmm. And your constitution says that no person shall be deprived of right to life and personal liberty save in accordance to law according to law and India has a procedure established by law. So what is the fundamental difference between procedure established by law and in accordance of law? Does it means a due process clause which was laterally interpreted by the Indian courts in Menka Gandhi or does it stands only positive law which was it was previously interpreted? So that is a judicial change which took place in Indian whether the similar approach is also adopted by the judiciary in Bangladesh as well. So these yeah. are the thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's a very pertinent question. And and let me let me say very briefly that the present position is same both in India and Bangladesh because, okay. because of the judicial pronouncements made in this regard. We know that in India, uh, the, the idea of due process was, was rigidly construed first, narrowly construed first, and that has been widened by later cons constitutional law cases. And in, that, that same thing happened in Bangladesh as well, that, uh, that it, was, it has been decided by the Supreme Court of Bangladesh that it includes due process of law that has been used from American constitutional law perspective. It, it, it includes both types of due process of law. Thank you, Professor. So now I would request to Sir Chaudhary to formally give a word of thanks because this entire activity we are doing for our students. And so we have our student chairperson, 
uh, who is the president of our student body, Tushar Chaudhary, I would request him to cast a word of thanks to Professor Ikramul Haq on the behalf of student fraternity, Tushar. Uh, good morning to one and all present. It is a matter of immense pride and pleasure for me to propose the vote of thanks on this momentous occasion. Uh, it was an absolute honor and privilege to host Professor Dr. Mohammed Ikramul Haq, sir. So I, Tushar Chaudhary, on behalf of Institute of Law, Nirma University, wholeheartedly extend my sincere thanks to Professor Dr. Mohammed Ikramul Haq for accepting our invitation and delivering an insightful and thought-provoking session on the impact of Indian Supreme Court judgments on the development of constitutional law in Bangladesh. So you touched upon various certain crucial aspects such as similarity between both the constitutions, various landmark judgment of the Indian Supreme Court, Suomoto writ for enforcement of fundamental rights, protection of environmental rights through PIL, basic structure, and many other crucial aspects of the constitutional law for a better comparison of the uh, both constitutions. I once again, thank you so much, sir. Next, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank to our respected Professor Dr. Purvi Pokhrial, ma'am, Director and Dean Institute of Law, Nirma University, for organizing the International Teaching Month for the students, which has served as a platform for knowledge sharing by distinguished persons from different walks of life. Next, I would also like to thank Professor Dr. Tarkesh Molia, sir, for moderating this session and ensuring a streamlined conduction of this session. Next, I'd like to thank the International Teaching Month 2021 team, Professor Shriya Sivastav, Head International Office, ILNU, Mr. Gagandeep Khanduja, Assistant Registrar, ILNU, Mr. Ramesh Nambishan, Office Superintendent, ILNU, Digan sir, and all the members of our administrative section for being the constant support behind this whole event. Lastly, a big thanks to all the faculties of ILNU and the students of ILNU for a patient listening, cooperation, and an active participation to ensure the success of this session. It was an absolute pleasure to host all of you all. I once again thank you all of you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.